You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. Davis, say you want to talk about your grizz method. Your underwear and- <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be something to walk up on? Oh my God. I'm always going to take that opportunity that has the least likely chance of busting them. There still may be elk in the area. I mean, I think it's definitely a case-by-case basis. You're going to find typically that they're a heck of a lot quieter. Rather than try to muscle off of a hind quarter by myself, I just take them right off at the muscle group. Grizzly bears are notorious. Looks like everything's golden and you go down and all of a sudden the freaking freight trains coming welcome to the gritty podcast i am your host brian call and i'm joined by brad hunt today's podcast is with our uh, well it's with a whole slew of dudes yep. from the uh, western hunting summit this is an elk discussion so at the end of each western hunting summit ryan lampers sits down with m- most of the attendees that were there and does a panel discussion where it's a Q&A with all the attendees yep. from the group asking uh, the panel of, of presenters and and uh, folks that were there questions. So in this, the panel consisted of Jason Phelps, uh, Brian Barney. Brian Barney, Mark Livesey. Mark Livesey. Cody Wilson. Mm-hmm. Um, yourself. Hillary was there. And it's just... It's great. I mean, you cannot get any more knowledge from a better group of guys. <clears throat> it's one of those things where we all get together and you have all these different opinions and different experiences, but each of us have quite a bit of, yeah. of experience, a lot of hours in the field, a lot of years doing this. and But yet we have different styles, personalities, yep. different experiences. And so we get a question fielded from the audience and... Um, and it's interesting to hear the the v- different opinions on the panel. Yep. I think Dave Baronio is on there as well. No, he's on the the dear one. Well, folks, get ready because <laughs> we did three of these, and I'm kind of mixing them all together. Um, the we're gonna drop this one this week, another one next week, a panel discussion. Ryan did three summits, so there's three different panel discussions yep. with different guests. Um, I really enjoyed these conversations, and on this one, was it this one? Mm-hmm. Well, this one we get into a little bit of hunter etiquette, which yep. becomes quite interesting. Um, you know, what do you do when, when uh, you know, you're on public land and yep. groups of people are converging and they're after similar areas, similar animals, and you R- know, Ryan wasn't sure. He was like, "Do we talk about it?" And I'm like, "Ryan, this is a great opportunity <laughs> for people to learn because some people don't know." Yeah, and and it. it it's great. You know, he doesn't bash There's various anybody. opinions on what's right or wrong there, but yep. this is a great discussion. You'll enjoy it. Absolutely. Um, before we get into that, we want to recommend you check out some of the partners that we're working mm-hmm. with. It always helps us keep doing what we're doing. Of course, Stealthy Nutrition, um, West, you know, for Western hunting, you need to be fueled properly, have the right health. Yep. And, uh, Hillary and Ryan have put together quite a few supplements that will help you do that from krill oil to CBD oil to, to vitamins and, um, electrolytes. So check those guys out. And also if you do not have a, 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 a stealthy hunter gun cover, yep. get one of those and a glassing pad. The glassing pads are amazing. You, yes. Everybody should have one. So check that out. Ryan's an incredible person and he's putting together um, some great products. Check them out. Support him. Support us. When you use the code gritty at Stealthy, that helps us as well. And then uh, Go Hunt. Check out Go Hunt. We have films that are going to drop with Go Hunt mm-hmm. here in the next few weeks. Yep. A whole series, maybe a three or four part. We're not sure, but um, these are going to be, these are great films. You're going to really enjoy them. And uh, Go Hunt uh, has a couple of different memberships that you can sign up for, become subscribers yep. with Go Hunt. For just 50 bucks, you can get their map tool. And uh, I highly recommend that. I highly recommend you have multiple map tools on your phone. Uh, Go Hunt's an excellent one to add. There's some incredible tools that they have on there that are pretty sweet, like the range finding tool. Yeah. Yep. That one's pretty awesome. I think their satellite imagery, that kind of made it for us on yeah. our hunt where some of the other products out there aren't as good on that. 
Each have their pros and cons, but Go Hunt's definitely worth the 50 bucks. Um, and you get all 50 states, yep. I believe. Correct. Uh, sharing between apps is much easier with Go Hunt. The features are being upgraded. The tools are being improved by the day. So check out yeah. Go Hunt for all for that stuff. Anything else, Brad? We should throw out there. Uh, I would do Mark's e scouting. Oh yeah, e scouting. Mark Livesey, Treeline Pursuits. Check out that. I mean, the, it's coming up real quick. Yep. It's a actually the perfect combination. Get uh, Mark's e scouting course and get the Go Hunt maps and yeah. uh, go to town. If you're a Go Hunt insider <coughs> as well, like all the mapping tools that you get there, I mean, what you, is Go Hunt insider? So the Go Hunt insider, I believe it's 150 bucks for the you year. You get everything, and you get everything. You get tag drawing odds to um, more in depth on your your pre scouting basically, mm-hmm. and you pair those up with the e scouting you for tag applications like yep. who, where do i want to put my focus draw in all odds, the different states everything. what Which, are the draws obviously this year is pretty much over they even have like drought data uh what you know what what projected growth for critters yep. uh all the historical data for animals taken in different right. areas so you can kind of really also get the, i think they have the best draw odds, draw odds calculator by far Absolutely. bar none a lot of uh, the the ones that you see out there say, oh, you've got a fifty percent chance when you really have a ten. Yep. Um, and uh, Go Hunt really gives you a realistic um, uh, expectation there, and so you can plan much better. Yep. Um, yeah, so pair that with the uh, with Mark says e scouting. If you uh, haven't got Mark's e scouting courses, you really need to. They're they're they will change your hunt life. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you take the course once, it's like 40, 30, 40 hours. Especially if you're a guy that is the type of person that gets boots on the ground to go scout. Mm-hmm. That guy's like Tony uh, Treat. Treat. He he was like, man, I could save 30 like, or 40 days a year. I should have. <laughs> he, he was at the sem- at the hunt, hunt hunting summit and he was like, I should have got into Mark's courses years ago. These yep. are These are, this is blowing my mind what's there truly it's a it's a gold mine of information sit down take a couple hours a week a couple hours yeah. once one hour a night or every other day or whatever and get yourself educated yes on uh, e-scouting and using these map tools from google earth to uh digital maps on your phone I mean, it's, it's mind-blowing what you'll learn from mark being able to import different different apps and or different things into different apps and yeah. google earth and i mean it is it changes everything yes absolutely. so check that out and uh let's get into the podcast hope you enjoy this one leave leave comments below let us know what you think like this video subscribe to the channel we appreciate all the support if you're listening on itunes give us a review thanks for everything stay gritty we are at the western hunting summit it's final day Everybody kind of has that look in their eye where they're like really tired, but they're kind of sad they have to leave, right? Yeah. Um, we have an amazing panel here uh, to answer your questions. Uh, I'll just, for the podcast sake, introduce these people. So we have the Joel Turner, right? We have the Mark Livesey, of course, Mr. E Scouting himself. Uh, we have Jason Phelps. This is really exciting because he's from our old stomping grounds of Washington. So we're excited to have him here. Brian Barney. You all know Brian Barney. He's just epic in backcountry hunting. And then of course, my amazing husband who never talks about himself and is probably one of the best hunters you'll ever meet. And he's just a genuinely awesome person. And then there's code. And then there's Cody here. I don't know. I don't know why he's He's here. (laughs) Sort of. Um, yeah, no, it, it's questionable. At times. Yeah, it is. And what's your last name? Wilson. I almost called you Cody Miller. I get my Cody's, the Corey's Ryan's. There's so many of the same named people here. So Cody Wilson, and he's a Wyoming guy. Ryan's hunted with him. He's been in some of Ryan Gritty's films. Um, he's he the called master me in a great elk. bull one year. He did. Has everybody seen the film of Ryan shooting that bull at how many yards? Like three or four, four yards. Four yards. Yeah. You haven't seen that? Oh, well, we maybe should have another movie day at lunch today. <laughs> and that is literally my favorite film that Gritty's done. It's literally the best elk hunting film that we've got. So it's amazing to see if you haven't already. Um, okay, so go ahead and ask your question. And Gritty, uh, Brian Call, who's supposed to be in here. Fashionably I late. I don't know where he is. I think I just heard him pull up. Oh, okay. So he'll be coming, strutting in here, sitting down. 
and you can ask your questions of him. There he is. VIP hey. style, rolling in late. Don't think we're okay. going to clap for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So go ahead. If you guys got questions, I'll reiterate the questions so that we can hear it on the podcast. And then whoever wants to answer can. Any tips for the breakdown process if hunting elk solo, specifically getting it quartered up and ready for pack out? Yeah, so I, I like to bone them out. I don't like to pack the bones out, but uh, I do the gutless method. I start on one side when I'm by myself. Uh, I work and I skin up from the knee joint up, and I work that whole side of the elk. I pull the quarter off. I stick the quarter on a tarp there, and then I pull all the meat off the bones. I do that back strap, and then my biggest tip or biggest secret is now I take off the head. And then I can flip over the elk and do the other side. So the horns don't get caught in the dirt or so he's tough to flip. But that's how I do it. Yeah. I I think another big thing to that is like if I'm by myself, I want to skin that animal down to where it's just if I pull that quarter off by myself, I can lay it right on top of the elk, not on the hide. So it's just clean, keeps it all clean. One of the big things that I do is – have a portable meat hook with you so you're not having to hold on to big chunks of meat. Uh, aboyer.com has got a, a packable meat hook made out of machined aluminum, and the hook is stainless steel. It's super handy. doesn't weigh much. You can hook that piece of meat while you're doing your boning process and transfer that right to the meat bag. I saw that for the first time when you guys did that. Mm. N- what was that? A n- Nil guy. Nil guy mm-hmm. at uh, Elk Sheep. It was I'm mm-hmm. going to get one. I, yeah. I never See, really realized. That's that's a llama hunter talking right yeah. there. Right? Yeah. I'm thinking, hook, I got to carry something extra. Do I really need it? But He acts like he's not a llama guy now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't really add much to that. I, I mean, the only thing I recommend is don't use the pack out bags. That's oh. Because you look stop. completely goofy if you've got those. <laughs> um, but no, same thing. Now, I do carry solo. I carry some extra paracord. Make sure I – most people do. But it's really helpful to tie those legs back uh, if you've got something to tie it to to get it skinned. It's really hard to handle a leg by yourself. And, guys, seriously, with the knives, especially you guys that just won those goat knives, um, we got to be more careful um, than we are with these new super sharp, sharp knives that are out there these days. Tying back that leg while you're doing the um, – you know. Uh, cutting underneath on the hide, it's not on top. Everybody probably knows that. But when you're pulling it out and you're trying to handle that leg, that's where bad things can happen. Right there, leg snaps loose, cut yourself by yourself. It's a big problem. I had a really good buddy that's super experienced. That was um, he had his bull all butchered by himself, and he was caping the head and stabbed it into his hand. One of those razor blade knives. He was able to to wrap it up. He had duct tape with him. Wrap it up with his sleeve. Stop the bleeding. Get to the emergency room, and then we packed his bull out the next day. But super experienced guy too. He was a a guide for bears he skinned hundreds of animals and he stabbed himself yep. so you're right we got to be super careful with yep. those razor knives and then the only thing i can add to, to brian's method is if you know how the muscles all lay in there one thing i like to do rather than try to muscle off a, a hind quarter by myself is i just take them right off at the muscle groups um, there's a white seam when you open up that hind you get on it you can start to feel it and then you just follow the three or four different stake groups together and then that way if i'm by myself i'm only dealing with 10 pounds of meat versus trying to use my shoulder for leverage and pry that whole quarter off i can take it off muscle by muscle good point um gutless versus gutted so i mean i always cut my animals i've tried gutless a couple times didn't really like it wasn't a huge fan um seems like a lot of you guys do the gutless method seems like all canadians like to gut their animals and all (laughs) americans (laughs) I don't do it. I've gutted one over the last hundred animals. My first one, and that was it's been a while. I, I gut them if I leave them overnight. Yeah, yeah. that was yeah. the only time I wasn't going to be able to break it down yeah. overnight. Yeah. Pull it out, tenderloins, heart, all that. Like now you got to go through the ribs. No, so it's super easy though. Yeah, so yeah. you find the hip bone on that bull where the back strap starts and where the 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 hind quarter starts. Um, go right behind the spine, and there'll be a little bit of a, a ligament. A tendon there, you cut that open and you can just roll the gut back. It's very, very easy, very, very clean to get without ever touching a bone. Um, and, and you can just get in there and, and follow it down um, until that last rib's in the way and then you can extract it right there. The opposite side, the second side is always going to be easier. 
um, when that meat rolls away, but yeah, very easy to go in. Um, we still get the heart out. We cut the, you know, the two ribs out, um, while it's on the, and we can get everything out without touching anything on the inside. So when you're doing that though, like for me, I found it didn't save me one ounce time. Like the, if your two guys can cut it now, it's 10 minutes or less. So having all that meat in there when you're doing that, it's like way more weight. So I found it was actually took us more time when we did. Maybe because I'm slower and didn't know how to do it right. But. Personal preference. I think you're fine gutting it if yeah. you like to do it that way. I'm quicker with the gutless method, not yeah. messing with the guts and then not spilling it any on the meat or it's such a huge gut bag on a, on an elk. So I like doing it without. I'm quicker, but you're not doing it wrong. You can continue to do it I that think way. There's a, there, I think there's quite a bit of, uh, with the, with the gut, there's a lot of contamination and, and, and things that just gets everywhere that I'd rather just not touch. You got to make a clean double lung kill. You can quickly kind of pull it all apart without ever breaking into all that, where all the feces and the urine and all that stuff is. You can stay away from the gut bile, all that kind of stuff. Keep yeah, it real I, clean. I remember back when we used to do pull the guts and all that. It's been a while, but, um, I just remember the one thing is, especially on an elk, you know, they got that huge cavity. And when you are, you do have to like reach in there and it just tends to get, you tend to get a lot more filthy. Like you get yep. your arms are up to your elbows trying to pull that sack out. So, yeah. And then yeah. while you're in grizz country, after now you're you, bloody. yeah, now you're yeah. bloody up to your shoulders. Live say, you want to talk about your you grizz method? And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said you don't wear underwear. Well, if I'm by myself, I'm usually. He's buck naked. naked. <laughs> yeah, you know, Wouldn't that be something to walk up on? Oh my God. In the woods. <laughs> when I run into Nightmare. random dudes on the trailhead, we kill an elk together, and then I leave my underwear on. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then they strip down. Then they strip down with me because they feel guilty that they're not naked. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. That's got TMI. I do have a question though. Like having done it both ways, you've all done it both ways. You know. No, I've only. Skin stuff with my clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know what I mean? Having done it gutless or gut method, uh, you know, having quite a bit of experience doing it both ways, what, would you agree that the gut, gutless is far faster in general? It's just maybe, maybe Mitch, you, 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 you haven't done it enough because I would say it's much faster. Yeah, yeah. By the time that 10 yeah. minutes is up, I've got a quarter off and I'm working on the other quarter or my buddy's already got that quarter off. So that 10 minutes that it would take to gut and get all dirty, I think we're, we're already flipping the thing over if we're, if we're working quick and I've got a good. Yeah. I mean, it, like you said, Jason, getting that T-loan out is really easy once yeah. you've done it a couple of times. And popping a couple slits in the ribs, pulling that rib back and grabbing the heart is, again, super easy. You still have to reach in, but you don't have to go as deep and uh, just get so filthy all the way up to your elbows. It, 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 for me, it's more just keeping the, the quality of the meat. Yeah. Uh, when you don't, you do the gut, too. You Somebody mentioned it about, especially solo, using the, using the elk as your table, you know, because it's difficult to handle these big chunks by yourself, you know. Jason was giving you some solutions for that, but using that very clean table that's not contaminated, I really like it. It's, you know, it's, it's not, cause when you gut, it becomes a slant. Yeah. You know, once you remove the, the guts, it becomes a slant and nothing just sits there. So I'm from Missouri, you know, so we gutted everything, you know, whitetails, that's all we did and whitetails, but for elk, I, my first couple of elk I did and dude, you're, you're, you're grizzly bait after you gut an elk. I mean, you're way up there getting stuff out, and and uh, so yeah, I think it's just to maintain the quality of the meat. On the grizzly thing, you know, uh, there I think there's some things you should mention there in terms of safety when you're solo and you're and you're cutting open an elk. First of all, I mean, it's really not good when it dies in a dense cover of brush, and then uh, a Fognac Island with Ranella. Those guys, you know, they they sort of they took that meat and put it in a dense patch where then they couldn't see if there was any animals around it one of the things you ought to do is at least get that meat away from the gut pile and into an area where you can see a good long ways around it so uh you don't get yourself in a dangerous situation coming if back you gotta go day. back for your meat to like yeah. as solo you know you're so you're gonna be going back um you gotta be like crazy careful um I, even in black bear country um black bears get they're not that aggressive unless they're that in that kind of situation, they can be pretty aggressive. That I've, I've had a couple that are kind of like wouldn't run off, you know, kind of like. 
but you got to be careful approaching and and grizzly bears are notorious for staying away from the kill but being able to smell it and see it you look down and it look i mean you guys great yeah it looks like everything's golden and you go down and all of a sudden the freaking freight train's coming yeah and uh so I killed a bull in Wyoming solo and I did, that was one time I gutted because I saw a bear, you know, while I was good, I said, I got to get out of here. It's getting dark. So I just gutted it and I pulled the guts as far and took them as far as I could away from the, the carcass and maybe he would eat that. Came back the next morning. I set up on the hill for an hour and just, I could see that it was in the open. Thank goodness. And I just glassed that elk. But he never, there was no, I shot at this bear to scare him. So it must have been enough to keep him away overnight. But I can tell you one, they had my boys, my llamas, and I'm like, boys, we're going to roll down there. This is going to be the fastest butcher job I've ever done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and there's not going to be no bone. There's going to be hooves and all are coming out on this one. And uh, so, yeah, be careful approaching. Um, and that's one time that I might recommend gutting one. If you've got a, they'll go for those guts. They, that's one of the first things they love to get. So sometimes I'll separate them and try to, deter him from getting on the carcass yeah I, I know from like experience in wyoming um you know whether it's hunting with ryan or any of these guys um it's you don't run into the grizzly issue as much like in archery because there's not much sound to it but like where we've hunted in the past with rifles like as soon as they hear that gunshot there's so many grizzlies now that it's like a dinner bell to them. That's what happened. They know something's mine dead. Was a, mine was a rifle. That's so what happened. That's exactly what happened. When me and Ryan went in Wyoming two years ago, Ryan killed his with a bow, but like two days later it went straight from archery to rifle, and we shot one with a gun. And, I mean, it was – we had that conversation like, hey, everybody hit on the swivel like, you know. I carry a shotgun with slugs in my truck. I get a bull down. I got to come back in. I carry that or, uh, thought about getting like a 45 70 as well. As you're working those elk, make sure to keep an eye on your downwind side, be picking your head up, be looking around, be hearing for stick snapping, like head on a swivel when you're working yep. on those things. Yeah. I, I would say the other thing that I would do for me, like if I got to go down there and I know I'm going to be after dark, I'll build a fire. Yeah. That's a good tip. Big Just fire. build a big fire. Don't build it big enough to you can see out and you can, the bear's going to see the fire. They don't really like fire. So good tip. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, so when hunting in Gers country, you lot of focus on, you know, your camp and meat recovery. What kind of tips or precautions when you're actually hunting in Gers country? Hunting a group. Have more than one person. Uh, we encountered it last year. We were calling a bull in. Um, Justin was slipping up just to put an arrow in him. Me and Dan were standing back calling, and a sow and a cub came to our calls, and she popped out of the brush at 20 yards. If we all three wouldn't have been there, he I mean, he probably would have got taken. But I think since all three of us were right close, like me and Dan had our guns out ready to go. Justin kind of lost it. He just – dropped his bow and took off running but <laughs> i was like that's not what you need to be doing but um yeah i mean hunting a group yeah i don't know the stats but i think uh once you have three guys in your group i think the fatality rate is almost nil yeah yep. zero right yep whereas solo yep. it's a big risk yeah head on a swivel give them a wide berth if i see a bear uh under 100 yards is fight or flight so I don't want to let that bear know I'm there. If I run into a bear inside 100 yards, I'm just going to sneak back out of there, not let him know I'm there. The only time I'm going to make myself seen is if he's coming at me, sees me, he's coming inside that 100 yards. Uh, but it, it's really watching with your glass. If you see a bear, I'm staying out of that area. I'm not trying to get in the same meadow, giving him wide spaces. And then uh, I like to camp off ridge lines and off trails, kind of in the thicker brush where bears don't wander in at night. Like I don't want to be where they just come through my camp at night and then just practice really good camping always cooking away from your camp always hanging your food no exceptions and never eat inside your tent this this probably won't make jason very happy but there's the possibility of just don't call in grizzly country you know like elk calling is great but 
But uh, I think you got to be careful about that setup. It can be extremely dangerous to elk call. I think a lot of the uh, fatalities or the, or the attacks in the uh, in Montana and Wyoming during elk season are due to a sequence of calling, attracting the bear, and then getting hit. You know, when you're kind of ghosting through the woods and you're hunting and you're you're taking that approach, I think. Um, you know, you're, you have a little bit more of an advantage of making sure you're avoiding grizzly bears. But sometimes I hear about a bear attack and I think, you know, you're solo, you were calling elk, you were looking over here. And like Brian said, you know, paying attention to, to where the wind is going. Um, you know, when they, when they can't get your scent, but they hear an elk, you know, it's, it's, I, it's, it's just scary to me. Ryan and I, we, we were, predator calling a black bear just to keep it from going over the hill and then we had two black bears charged within 30 yards of us like that and we had a grizzly there that morning and i i just go back in my mind going we didn't even see that black bear till i got home and looked at it on the computer and saw that there that it was there so um i always think what if that was a grizzly you know like and it was due to the calling we wouldn't have been in that dangerous situation if we didn't call but then calling's effective so yeah, don't overlook things in your camp either, like your toothpaste, your toothbrush, like anything that has got a scent, they're going to be attracted to it. So Your Copenhagen. That too. Yep. <laughs> Regarding thermals, at, at what point in time do, does directional wind overtake thermal? Every time. I think most of the time. I mean, Brian mm-hmm. was said it right. Yep. Unless it's a really light breeze and it's super – like – I. Tell me, when I see like a storm front rolling, you know, and the temperature drops like drastically, that's one of the few times I'll see the thermals overpower a little bit of a prevailing mm-hmm. wind. But any significant wind will, to me, yep. will overtake unless the Unless you're in a draw or in a lull where the directionals aren't coming across, then thermals will be uh, present in that draw, down in that low spot. You'll have directionals in there, or thermals in there, even though the directionals are up top on the ridge lines. But most of the time, uh, you're right, the directionals are going to overpower the thermals. I don't think you covered it this time, but the last time you talked about it, I, it's amazing, and I'm so glad you said it, but I don't think you covered it this time about when you get close to the top of a ridge, you get the, the swirl effect, right? Yep. So yep. One, I, mean, I love the way you explain that. I think that's a good, if you want yeah, to Yeah, uh, uh, the, the lee wind side, like I love hunting elk on a dominant wind side, that the directionals are blowing against or blowing through, but when you get on that back side, on the lee wind side, that wind just comes right over the top, and it's like a washing machine, and it just swirls in there, and there is no killing elk on that lee wind side, at least the top third of it, top half of it. Uh, that wind is so bad over the back side of a ridge. So I try to avoid hunting elk on that lee wind side on the top of it. Are you finding that elk are less, are calling less in wolf country? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. If there's been wolves in there, there still may be elk in the area, but you're going to find typically that they're a heck of a lot quieter. They don't want to talk. They're still doing elk things, like they're still rutting and doing their thing, but they're not talking near as much. Yeah, I have a spot, one of my spots in Idaho that has three different drainages off of it, and those wolves would move from drainage to drainage to drainage, and we would try to, you know, almost as important as night locating, we would go night locate wolves, because if that wolf was in Canyon A, the next morning it would be completely shut off. Even if the elk decided not to leave, we can glass them. I could go in there and not get anything to call. We moved to, to Canyon B that the wolves aren't in and those elk are talking. So they know that they're in there. They will be more quiet. You can put some pressure on them, get them to talk, but it's it's one of those um, you know multiplication factors on it, it's going to make it tougher if i can't hear something bugle um so yeah it, we we've, we've noticed that we've been able to to set our our hunt plan change our hunt plan based on which canyon those wolves were in and inevitably they're going to be in one of those three canyons you know every night Do you, i want to ask you jason that you're here so what i my strategy i'm going to see if it's anything valid but in wolf cut when there's wolves around or i think they're around or i've seen tracks i start calling more often because I found the elk will not respond unless you're freaking close. Yeah. Like, right? right? Like, yep. I've, like even 200 yards away, I had a case where we, I called and I walked. And I don't even know why. how I started learning this was I kind of lost track. And I'm like, oh, I, I'm going to call again. And I literally only walked. A li- and he answered. I just got to that bubble zone. 
and even in wolf country. I mean, and uh, so I, it, it sounds kind of weird, but the more wolves, the more calling I do just so because. I, I was going to say, I found like um, locate bugles don't really work because you're, you're just like, and you're trying to figure out where all the elk are. It doesn't really work because usually w- what I've seen is when they bugle back, they go, me. And you got to be close enough to hear them. Like you'll, I'll come on a herd and I'll see a bunch of them all over this hillside and I'll bugle and you'll hear the bulls just, yeah, yeah. They keep that volume low just so it kind of carries a little ways. They don't want to announce their presence to the world, but they also can't help but respond, you know? Yeah. I, I cherry pick my bugles a little bit more, maybe not bugle as much, but I'm, I'm more, I guess I, I maybe bugle less or the same, but I, I'm really concentrating on like what I think is where they're going to be. Okay. Not just my random bugles like normal. I'm like, I think they're going to be in this better in this creek drainage um, and, and try to focus my energy there versus bugling the whole way down the trail. But yeah, I, I agree. You, you do, uh, your bugle more will be more successful because you, you do have to be right on top of them um, when those wolves are in the area. I would also say that my experience has been you're calling, you're calling, you're calling, you're calling. You might get just one peep. And you're like, oh, there's a bull. And then you're calling, 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 and they come in. They just, they're okay with you making all that noise. They just don't want to make the noise. So they're just more. And I, typically, if I get that one little response and I'm like, oh, he's not that far, instead of calling, I'll just resort to like raking or breaking brush instead of announcing, you know, hey, here's all the elk. So an open country question. If you have a pole bedded on the ridge side across from you, and there's an open creek bottom, are you going to risk, I'll say, trying to go to his hind side to cross over that creek? Or are you going to risk, I'll say, going in the entire way around and maybe him getting up and moving in that time? Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely a case-by-case basis, you know. If if I can get down through that canyon without him seeing me, I will. But most times in that open country, he's going to catch my movement coming down and after him that I'd rather take the slower approach, go all the way around, make a quality play instead of risking getting busted crossing that canyon. But it is a case-by-case basis. If you could pick enough cover to get down and get to him and you got the wind right and can get up that canyon and kind of put trees in between, between you and him, then I might consider it. But I, I think for the most part, uh, I'm going to take the, the circle around, have him not see me, not expose myself, not give myself away. Yeah, I'm the same. Yep. I'm always going to, I'm always going to take that opportunity that has the least likely chance of busting them for sure. We were just yep. talking about this the other day, but, uh, I'll take that long route every time. Yeah. Even like, though you do lose sight of them for a bit. Um, yeah, if there's a crack at him seeing you picking you off on that downhill as you ascend down in there, it's not worth it, I don't think. I think the wind is a big deal. So in open country, a lot of times, you know, you'll get this wind. I don't like to go after elk in the morning because they always seem to be going from their feeding area to their bedding area. And at night, you're waiting for them to come from their bedding area to their feeding area. And and you're always in a time crunch between where they're going to go. I like to go for them after they're the, in the afternoon in the afternoon the wind is usually blowing uphill the thermals are doing what you want if you have a directional it's a different case but if the if it's a hot september day wind is blowing hard uphill then i would rather just go around there's that hundred percent chance of not getting caught i like that that percentage you get on top and the wind's blowing hard uphill I get down on my back or my butt and I butt crawl 300 yards or whatever I need to, to get within bow range in open country. That's how I like to do it. And that's, I w- that's, that's the approach in anything else uh, coming from the bottom that I haven't found it to be very, very easy to do because of the wind one and then, and then visuals. So it's kind of a scenario question and it's kind of ambiguous. I apologize, but, um, I know you, a lot of you guys go so far back in that you, you're not bothered with other hunters on public land, but somebody might drop in on you. So I decided to put calls away. Um, my, I'm hunting this, what I consider a horror bull. It's got like 20 cows or something last year. I'm about three hours into this thing. I'm within 100 yards of the bull. And all of a sudden in, in the, the, the ridge, 
trees beside me, here come these hunters. I've made a sound. And do you, do you, do you kind of hunt the hunter at that point and see what the, the elk do? I, I, again, I know it's ambiguous, but I didn't know whether I should start making noise to get them to look at me, which I didn't want to do. What ended up happening is I, I tried to blow a, a, a cow call to other hunters. I got their attention. I tried waving them off. Uh, they took no heed to it. And so then I, I got out of where I was at. I ran down the ridge thinking I was going to intercept once they blew them out because I, I knew they were going to blow them out. They went down to the bottom <coughs> and they were I had in my face. So if you get in a situation where you guys who don't call are putting stock on and all of a sudden hunters are coming in and this is bull that you want, what do you do? So your question, your question is, you're, you're on a bull, you've been working on it, it's a great, you know, you're working hard and all of a sudden some hunters show up and they're kind of about to crash maybe the party. Your question is, how do you handle that situation? Right? Yeah. If he would have called to him, he <laughs> yeah, probably right. would have already Ryan, called. Ryan, do you let, want to take let, this one? Let's, let's, let, let's, let Ryan. let's hear what Lambert <laughs> has to say. <laughs> Why? Why me? <laughs> um, I'm going to take every opportunity if possible to go try to talk to those guys <laughs> and see if they're cool friendly or if they're not cool um if they're any kind of decent and you explain the situation they're going to either take a different route or back off because you've been working this bull um i always go pretty easy on them in the beginning and <laughs> until they're not very nice and they don't care but uh you know sometimes those conversations go great like they're very respectful yep there's some great people out there that respect it. You've been putting in all this work. You're putting yourself in a great position to kill this thing. Um, and, and respectfully, maybe they'll take a different route out or different approach out of there. But obviously today that we don't know who all's out there and we've run into people who are not respectful. Um, and that's just going to happen these days on public land. And we've had it happen quite often. Have you ever encountered a situation like that and then sort of, made the person feel really bad and then felt guilty later. And then felt guilty later. Mm. Like guilty is maybe not the right word, but a little bit of sympathy. <laughs> Look, I still don't feel very guilty about that I situation. Was there's, say, there's a particular once situation Ryan they're gets talking to about. That, he's not gonna feel guilty. <laughs> yeah. Should we even tell yeah. that story just tell to let him know what Yeah. The what guys happened. are probably gonna listen to our podcast. They'll hear yeah. it. I think it's a scenario based uh Discussion. It's going to happen to a lot of folks. Yeah. Okay. All right. Here we, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> so we, we – uh, the, the dirt. Yeah. We had uh, – there was a few of us, um, me and Brad and Kayam, who's here. Um, I had just taken a bear. And prior to that, we had this nice little perch, and, you know, I shot the bear from this perch. We were hunting off this. This was our glassing area. We had this area kind of just covered. There was nobody up here that we knew of. Um, we dropped all our gear because I just shot this bear. We have to make this steep descent into the creek. We got to deal with rafts. We got to go up the other side, I don't know, 1,200 feet or something like that, and go grab this bear. And so in the process of doing that, we're over there, grab a couple photos, um, we look back and there's some folks that are glassing us from the other side. We're like, Oh, cool. Wow. These guys work their tail off to get up here. Well, um, they're waving at us like way over there. And, you know, we, we end up breaking this bear down back down to the bottom across the Creek. Well, before that we look up, they had saw our gear pile that we had dumped in the process to go get our bear. They come down there and they start unpacking their stuff and they throw up a Dyneema Cimarron of all things, um, seek outside shelter. And, uh, they threw it up within 10 feet of our gear pile, which is where we were hunting from glassing from. And they couldn't, it was 10 feet from it. <clears throat> and so, Instantly, that was like very disrespectful. Like, who does that? Who, 
who would come in and just literally park on your gear where obviously we're set up with the spotter and all of our stuff to hunt from here. Well, they did that. It was a father and his two sons. His two sons were probably in their thirties. Um, now I guess we should mention they ran into us at the Western hunting expo, right. And had long conversations. Um, I think Mark slipped up and probably gave him the canyon where we were hunting. Oh. <laughs> Mark, loose lips sink ships. Loose uh, lips, live a say. So we call him. <laughs> <laughs> this e scouting, he just gives people locations. Uh, no, just joking about that. But I'm going to add some onto the end of this story. I've got my own little version of that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I bet you do. So, um, I was mad. I was pretty angry because, you know, there's, there's courtesy that, it's like we all know that was kind of a cruddy thing to do. So I stomp up the hill. I got a whole, you know bear on my back, and I'm pretty pissed off. And, uh, and he's I get probably to the top. super dirty, scary looking, sweating. <laughs> yeah, it was a it was a grind. It was kind of end of the day. Now we get up there, and uh, the guy looks over as I crest over right right where my gear pile was, and he's like, "Hey, Ryan." So he knew who we were, I guess. Um, and I didn't say anything, but I gave him about as big a stink eye as I probably have ever given anybody. Um, he, he clearly knew immediately that I wasn't real happy with the situation. And his sons won't even look at us at this point. So we just start grabbing our gear, um, loading it up. Kayim gets up there and, um, you know, he asks, he's like, I can tell you're mad. He says, I can tell you're mad. I was like, yep, we're pretty pissed off right now because you just put your tent right where Is we are. Is the father asking this question? The father was. Um, and, you know, we had talked to these kids at, at this event, and they were cool, great guys. And uh, honestly, the father was very respectful um, in the conversation. He never, he never really got angry. He understood that we were mad. And he understood that he had screwed up. Um, what I would have loved to have hear, heard from him was, you know what? You're right. We're going to get our camp and let you guys have this perch that you're obviously you've been on for, for days. Um, but he didn't do that. And so we walked away. Basically, you know, it never got yelling or anything like that. But I let him know. I was like, this is a crappy move that you guys did here. Just so you know, we're not happy with it. Um, I wish what you guys would have done is seen our gear. And even though you wanted to hunt this area, maybe just push on a little bit, just push up the Canyon another mile or half mile. Um, and what he said was his reasoning was, well, we won't look that way. We'll just look this way, you know, on this side of the mountain. It's like, well, we want to look that way too. I mean, that's, we kind of are on this perch to kind of look 360 around us, you know? Um, so and that's not the first time that has happened. That's has happened repeatedly. And the response has been the same each time. Well, you look over there and we'll look over here. And we just don't want to hunt like that, you know? <laughs> um, so it kind of ended like that. You know, it was one of those deals where I'm glad that he didn't escalate it and, and start yelling. I could tell he was um, kind of ashamed that he did that, made that move. We walked away. Next day, we actually hiked out, uh, took my bear out, and um, um, got it checked in and all that. We, we were coming back in, and they were leaving the area. Um, I wish they hadn't had done that, so I did feel bad that they left the entire area. I wish they had just pushed past us. One more ridge, you know, looked at something that we weren't literally hunting that day in that moment. So, um but I still felt like I was within my rights of <laughs> saying to them, this is a rotten move. So, yeah. I'm just going to add, he did. So what happened? <laughs> Actually, <laughs> um, they were on their spot. We were, we were still, um, I, we were hiding closer to camp, my, my partner and I. And so that we get back, we get the story and, uh, in the early morning hours, these dudes have packed their camp up after Ryan has shamed them. Now, remember, <laughs> these dudes are like mini lampers, okay? <laughs> They're wearing stone puppy coats, 
They're wearing stone pants. They're wearing Lapona boots. They're wearing stone pack. I mean, it looks like three lambers walking down the trail. <laughs> so their idol has just destroyed them <laughs> on, on the side of the mountain. <laughs> so, so in the early hours of the morning, these guys had packed up their, and started kind of, because in this particular spot, you have to camp very near the trail. And they knew we were between them and their trucks with our llamas and everything. So they had to slip by us. <laughs> So that Rant Lampers wouldn't come running out a second time and give them another tongue lashing. So they come slipping by us. And then I guess you guys did see them when you went in. Went. So that's how that story wrapped up. Yeah. yeah. Well, I feel like you have to talk to people. Uh, you have to have these conversations because some people just don't get it. Um, we don't go in there to have somebody just literally. And Brian and I have had this situation before as well where we're literally parked. We got our camp right here. And they come and they, they see us and they set up glassing 40 yards from us, right? And you have to talk to them and say, this isn't okay. We didn't come all the way back here to have you come here and sit right next to us and then tell us, well, you guys look that way and we'll look this way. What's the rule? You know, because I did a podcast a little bit ago uh, on two guys that were fighting over the same buck, basically trying to kill the same buck in uh, – in well it doesn't matter where but they were trying to kill the same deer and they had a lot of stepping on toes and and all of this and one person's viewpoint is hey it's public land i can just do what i you know hey all is fair good luck to you but i don't care where you're at and another person's like there's this rule like if somebody's already there this is how you should treat the situation you know what what's sort of just some ground rules high level that are obvious to you well, all I know is how I would treat that situation. If I came up there and I saw that these guys had their gear pile sitting there, or if like when you and I had that situation, if these guys are literally glassing and they got their their tent sitting right here, I'm going to move on. I'm going to just go find country that they're not looking at. I'm going to be respectful that they got there first. This is their little area. I'll have a conversation and say, hey, I'm going to go over here. You know, um, It would have been great. If they would have just said, we'll just move up range a little bit or over here, whatever. In the, at the end of that conversation, though, I let them know, you know what? I wish you would have done that, but we're going to go ahead and we're going to push up past this. You guys can hunt this right where our stuff is. We're going to pack up and go hunt something else. I just wish you would have done the same. So, I think it's uh, especially gets more difficult when someone has perhaps a specific animal they're after. And they've been scouting it maybe in July and August, uh, like a muley buck. And, and they have these plans and, and all of this stuff. And, and they have their hearts set. Maybe they hunted it the year before as well and didn't get it. And they're going back for the same deer. They show up and someone else is already there and on the deer and glassing it. Well, what's the role of that person? I mean, they feel some ownership of that animal. They invested a lot of time. Just because you got there one day earlier, do you get to then have the base? And like, there's a lot of emotions and feelings and not everybody is Ryan Lampers and can just go five miles over there and find another one. The rest of us have to like, you know. Yeah. All I can speak for is myself. I'm antisocial in life and I'm very (laughs) antisocial on the mountain. I want to avoid people at all costs. I'm going to move away from people every time I can. So I don't know about you guys, but I do the same. Same. I just move on. I give guys their space. If they're hunting a drainage, hunting a direction, you guys have that. I'll go the other way. If I run into guys, I just give them their space. I just head the other way. I'm not looking to combat bow hunt for animals. (laughs) I don't care how big they are. Like I want to go find my own experience on the mountain. There's always a place where guys aren't looking. And, and just like Ryan, I'll have a conversation or talk about where I'm going to head or talk with guys. But, uh, I, I give guys their space, give them respect, and and I expect the same in return. And um, yeah, sometimes um, you got to let them know and or educate them of what the right move is. And I've had plenty of guys that 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 do the right thing. You know, I've had uh, bulls I'm on, and guys coming up behind us and talk to him and say, "Hey, we're on these bulls. I've got two of my buddies up there. They're in front. Can you hunt a different drainage?" Yeah, no problem. We didn't know you were in here. We'll go the other way. And that's usually what happens. Uh, usually guys are really respectful. They want to find their own space to hunt. And so I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to have a conversation. And when I see guys, uh, I'm pretty antisocial on the mountain as well. Usually I just head the other direction and let them have it and go find my own space. Yep. Yeah. And you know, the situation that Brian and I had, we had actually met these guys 
Um, they basically camped right where we were. We told them, we had the conversation. I thought it went well this evening. We're like, you know what? All right, well, we're going to go push way back up in here and, you know, we're going to go find different stuff, even though we had been there first. Um, but we, they went and they parked right in front of our tent where we were. So we said, you know what, guys? All right, we already have plans. We're going to go ahead and push past you guys and go way up in this different drainage. We thought it went well. And yet the next morning, where were they when we woke up? 40 yards from our camp, sitting there thinking that it was okay it was to really, sit right next to us. It was really strange, too, because when we ran into them the night before and we had a long, we waited at their their shelter to have a conversation so we could just all get on the same page. Um, and the fellows were really nice, uh, but they they uh, presented as though they had never seen us or heard of us. Had We just happened to be here, and we're like, we're in a spot where, I mean, you got to know this spot to get to this spot. This is this is crazy, you know, days to get to this spot. It's fishy. Um, so the next day when they camped 40, when they started glassing 40 yards from the teepee, Ryan lost his mind. And he marched straight over to there like, and under that pressure, they just, okay, we know exactly who we are. We, we watched some of your films. We saw a buck in your video we wanted to go after. We basically found out exactly where you're at, and then we came here. They reached out to outfitters in the general area and they talked to as many as they could and, and figured it out. Like, so, Of all the things, you know, um, there's so much country out there, you know, uh, and we experienced this because we put our films out and over the years we've become more and more narrow with, and what we say and share because there's just enough people out there without the etiquette or the respect that they literally will see something, a buck you didn't get that year, and they will come back and try to get that buck th the next year. They'll figure out exactly where you're at um, if you give them too much information. And so those people are just going to be out there. And these guys are capable. They could have gone. They didn't need our intel to pull off a good hunt. Um, Consistent hunters, you don't look for, for other places people are hunting. You look for your own areas and to build your skills to be able to find these areas and find trophy critters. And um, uh, for the most part, people are pretty good. But on public land, you're going to have guys screw up your hunt. I mean, I've been sitting on a big bull that I have bedded, and I've had guys work the ridge line. No idea is there. Wind blows down. They bust out. My hunt's over. But that happens, you know, one out of six times, one out of ten times. And I just have to swallow it up on that one, and i got to go find some more they didn't mean to do it uh, the there's no conflict there you know in in that circumstance so it, it is public land hunting but this, it is tough this is where the e-scouting course by livesey is really handy i interviewed kip fowler who's you know he's killed a lot of stud mule deer in a pretty in a pretty high pressure area in, in utah in the wasatch area and he's been killing monsters forever up there and he's he we were talking about it and he's like well i have you know, I scout a little bit in July on the weekends, every weekend up through July and some of August. And then the season starts. I have three or four deer that I'm, I'm excited about and they're in different locations. And so I have buck one, buck two, buck three, buck four. If this is my number one choice, if there's three or four guys there, I roll over to plan B. If there's a couple guys there, I roll over to plan C. And usually there's all, there's all, there's one that he's ready for. Mark has his elk hunting strategy where he's like, okay, make sure that you have like three or four areas you're going to hit that piggyback off of this spot and this spot and this spot so that you're not wasting any time. And you've pre-scouted all of that. So when you get to that area, you're not like, oh crap, there's somebody here and you have no other plan. If you have backup plans, it's so nice to just, okay, well, I'm going to roll over to here. I'm going to roll over next. This is the next step in the plan, and, and you're ahead of the game. Like those guys he's talking about, <clears throat> think about what it took to look through a video, scrutinize it, because, I mean, Brian does a pretty good job. It's not easy, right? And then to start calling outfitters, asking that kind of question. If they just spent that much energy on some e-scouting, They'd be a lot better shape, Gilbo. Because let me tell you, if you go into drains with Ryan Lampers, your chances of getting that 
that mule deer over him is about zero. So, <laughs> I mean, you're already at a disadvantage. <laughs> I'm still mad. It cost me a big deer, too. Because... <laughs> Are you? <laughs> <laughs> while they while we're having this discussion, the buck I'm after. So I went over and <laughs> talked about the situation with these guys, and you know, Brian, I my conversations are very short, like a few words, and that was it. Brian rolls over, and now he's holding court for like two hours. <laughs> like prime glassing time, right? Smoothing it all out, I guess. And so I stand up and. uh you know, I, I kind of walk on the ridge. They're like just off the ridge. They're glassing this this side over here. I kind of get up, stretch, come up here. I'm still kind of mad. And I start walking ridge just off the side. And I see the buck that Brian wanted. We had spotted him uh day before or two days before. <laughs> and he's coming right at us um, with six does. 250? He's just over 200 yards, and he's walking right at us. And uh, my first reaction was, go tell Brian the buck's coming. <laughs> but then I was like, well, he's having a conversation with these guys. Kind of like to not have them a part of this hunt. So I started pacing the top there, literally trying to herd this buck to go back the other way. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it, it did go back the other way. Ryan probably talked to Never these guys to be seen again. another three hours. <laughs> <laughs> the problem was that I didn't want to shoot the buck. When Brian has conversations, it could go two to five <laughs> hours. 15 long. minutes. So that We're buck had ample time minutes. to go high when has and a disappear. Conversation ever been 15 minutes. We, we got on him, but it was just a little too far, but to reach and, and then, then he's gone forever. But I, I felt like uh, I also didn't want to shoot a buck right there with those guys there. And then, and then, um, you know, they were already horning in on the spot and stuff. And just, it was a bad, left a bad taste in her mouth. That was, uh, that was a long 10 day hunt and neither of us got a deer. It was like one of the first skunked trips we'd been on in a while. It was a rough trip. Hmm? Have y'all been back to that spot? Um, we don't really talk about where we go, but Ryan has smoked some giant since then <laughs> in the vicinity. <laughs> oh, I think he sufficiently deterred them from coming back. <laughs> 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 yeah, they actually felt bad. Uh, it took a lot to get them to feel bad, but they eventually did, and they just picked up their gear and left. And they apologized later, sent some texts and stuff, and. Okay, so my question is, so there's a lot of private landowners out there, um, and there's a lot of public land right next to it. So I, my daughter's dad had a business last year where these outdoors tried to come off this private land into the, the public land that he could have shot them, or they, she could have shot them, and they first fell. Um, and the private landowner basically stepped in front of them and heard the elk. Like, what do you guys think about that situation? Call fishing game. Yeah, it's yeah. real crummy, but call fishing yeah. game. Yeah, call the game warden. That's a uh, hunter harassment. Yep. Yeah, yeah, they can't do it. Don't take it in your own hands or anything. Uh, man, some of these places are just shady in the way they operate. They can get away with things, but I would definitely call the game warden and have a conversation about that ranch. And that isn't going to fix that scenario. You're still going to have to go find another elk and find another spot to hunt. Uh, but at least maybe it'll stop him from doing it again. Yep. Because what they were doing is they had some, they were guiding on their property and they had some hunters on it. They were trying to push them back to the hunter. Yep. Didn't Dan yeah. Staten, Elk Shape, have a little That was thing more like outfitter that? harassment, yeah. with blocking gates and, yep. and stuff. and Lying about where the public land yeah. lines I mean, was. And, and we always have our phones with us. Like As much as I hate it, and, and I hate the whole part of the legal system, Like get your phone out and just video it too a little bit before you call the game warden, just so it's not a you said versus he said. Yeah, because I mean, that situation, I mean, I don't know how personally I would handle that, because I'm not always a level-headed guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. like that kind of stuff just in that just you know like yeah. his situation. that's I think um, the way typically we've handled it is we go nowhere near any private property um, well just you know there's just a lot of areas where you you know you're getting up especially in some states like Colorado I, I it just tends to happen because there's private and public all mixed and it's awesome country 
But generally, if you go like Wade remote, you know, you're not going to run into that problem. It's less prevalent. But those big animals get on private for a reason. You know, there's hunting on the edge of it's kind of nice because there's some big, big ones. But so, what are some strategies to if you're hunting the edges of those boundaries to capitalize? If they're whether they're on the public <coughs> or the private, what are some strategies to try and? I, I try to stay away from private land. He's got boys. llamas, so yeah. he's way far from. I mean, I've I've hunted some of those, you know, property boundary areas. Um, I don't similar to these guys. I don't want to hunt it if it's a flat walk and I can get around there in ten minutes. I like the property boundaries where I've got to climb, you know, five hundred feet to get around the corner and then drop five hundred feet. So I, I like those property boundaries where we can get in. Um, it's just tough. I mean, there whether you want to call it harassment or whether somebody wants to randomly get in their four wheeler and drive the perimeter every night um, as a as a fine line. And there are a lot of places like that that you know good good private land they know what they've got and they keep the resources on their private land um if you get to the more remote bigger chunks of land typically is better if somebody's got you know a smaller chunk of land there they're typically trying to you know you can call it harassment or call it whatever you want to call it but um yeah the more remote the more difficult it is to get to that property boundary um the better it's going to be but i I, aside from that like it's just you're taking a gamble on on hunting that edge or if it's easy to get to other people are going to most likely be there what if the elk are all in the public well so we were just talking who was i talking to about the private oh it was tyler he just left he was asking a similar question so what i do if i'm going to do it which i rarely just don't do it but treat it like that trail analysis study that private land border look for four-wheeler tracks up on the edges if if they're coming up there and they're running the perimeters you're going to see those tracks now, that doesn't mean they're going to do it. But when I see a private land border, no tracks, nothing going up near the forest, I'm like, okay, maybe maybe they're letting things be, right? <laughs> um, if I'm just – if it looks like a highway on that border, like they're checking the fence on an hourly basis kind of – then I might be less yeah. likely to be closer to that border, right? But if that private land, if you zoom in on Google Earth and start studying it, looking for activity, it's really yeah. pretty telling, uh, especially private land because they drive the same roads and leave really well defined. I've had some pretty good hunts next to private that I, when I looked at it, there was no sign they'd even driven by this corner. Now they probably had, but it wasn't like truck tracks or nothing. And, and the elk were just going back and forth, like no problems. Yeah. So, you know, study the land a little bit if you're going to go into a spot like that. And I'll hunt some of this country where I'll hunt edges of private and public for sure. But you know, don't get trapped in hunting the edge of a alfalfa field that they're never going to cross, where the elk are on private and you're just hiking around hoping for a whim and a prayer that they come your way and cross. Like, I like the spots that are private, public, where the animals don't really know where the line is, where you're getting back, just like Jason was saying, where you're using a 500-foot climb or you're working way back, where there's animals on both sides. There's animals on private, on public, and then hunting your public border. And I think it's also important... Uh, that you give yourself a buffer from that private land border. So if you hit an elk with an arrow, he doesn't run onto that private land. If he runs on that private land, you have to call the landowner and get permission to get him, or you have to call the game warden to pressure the landowner to get that bull, and I don't want to mess with any of that. And so usually I'm not hunting right on the border. I'm going to give myself a buffer, and and there is good country that's on the edges of private and public. So I do hunt it. Like you said, if the animals are on public back there, nobody chasing them. Like, like I'd go after those animals for sure. So I just look for the country where they're, uh, uh, don't know the border so well, or don't look for the spots where they're in alfalfa, where they're never going to cross onto that public, where you're just sitting there on public watching them and getting frustrated. And it's not my favorite type of hunting, but there are a lot of edges that are really good hunting. So, uh, don't overlook it for sure. Don't be afraid to go ask the landowner either. I've got guys in Wyoming that absolutely hate moose on their property. I just go knock on their door. He's got 3,000 acres of prime real estate right on the river, willows, everything you could want to go kill a moose. I went and knocked on his door. He's like, you go kill one, you don't tag it. You take it to town and come back and shoot another one. <laughs> like he hated him that much. So, I mean, don't be afraid to go ask. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've. 
I've seen this scenario where uh, elk have different reasons for going to private. Sometimes the hunting pressure push them onto the private. Sometimes the private that they go to is overgrazed. Like it's BLM, they've got cattle rights on there and they just ate the hell out of it. But it's safety from hunters, it's refuge. So they want to get back onto the public to eat and do all that kind of stuff. So you'll see them like run over to private during the day, get on it and then come back over to the public where the food is better because it's just all the cattle messed it up. You'll see the other situation where maybe they're going over to, they, they go and feed in the alfalfa, but they don't want to spend the day there. It's hot. It's, there's no, no cover. They, they, they leave the alfalfa and they go up to the top of the mountain five miles from the alfalfa and they bed up in the mountains and then they come back down and go to the alfalfa on the private every day. You'll get that kind of behavior from elk. And so if you can kind of work, figure that out, what they're doing and when, and, and if you don't have a lot of pressure uh in the spot you're in where that where these elk are migrating back and forth each day you can work a pretty cool hunt i think uh i've done it before and i think you can um you can you can yeah you can capitalize on on that kind of situation if you are in your private how much how much of a buffer do you give them with an arrow or a rifle (laughs) (laughs) with an arrow I like to give them at least 300 yards, 500 yards where I'm not hunting that, that real edge of that thing. Give them enough time where if I hit them with a good arrow, he's going to die, not make it across the fence. Yep. You guys talked a little bit about um, thermals, like in cool creek bottoms. I've always heard of like this back eddy effect, but I'm not quite sure I understand. The- I was in Emily once, and there was my buddy Anthony had a great tag, and there was a bull uh the wind was everywhere just doing this and it was along a stream bed and it was pretty steep on each side and the bull was up here on the bank bugling and there's really no way to get to it because he didn't come to the calls but he called so, but we figured out that if we get in the creek bed and we walk right along the edge of the creek that those thermals just rip down the creek and they just suck down and so we went all the way up to where we were about 100 yards from the bull really easy it was a perfect little route in there it was beautiful and but as soon as anthony started to climb up the hill and he got about kind of out of the it was about maybe 15 yards high as soon as he started to go over the wind would just blow up so if he stayed low it would suck down so then it was a matter of just calling and calling and calling and calling and breaking branches raking trees and splashing water and trying to make it sound like there's a party down here and then the bull came and gave him a, like a 25 yard shot yeah typically the steeper that canyon the more the more you're going to be able to get that downdraft, downstream draw, the more it opens up, that wind turns into a soup sandwich at some point. You're getting up out of the creek, and then you've got the up thermals that are you know, mixing with that down creek therm, you know, wind direction, and that's where it gets really, really crazy. And, and all, many times, you know, 2014 Tianaway hunt I was on, we just end up walking down the ridge, get way downwind of the bulls, get in the creek, and then come up the creek. And then ahead of time, you know, 100, 200 yards ahead of time, you need to get up and then get your wind going up above him if whatever wall is on. So we'll use that as a strategy. Many times we've walked straight up a creek so that we can keep that wind. And then you just have to figure out at some point you got to bounce out, though, so you can now get your wind to go up above him and stay out of that, like, mixing zone. You, you can't break the rules, though. Like, if you, if you know, like, <laughs> this is any further and the wind might – go the other way it's like all right this is as far as i can go and it's matter like anthony's sitting there and that bull's like 50 60 yards in the trees it's too but if he could just go 15 yards he has well it won't work so if you can maintain that discipline stay behind that line where that wind is and just obey it and just keep working keep working hopefully it happens but there is no point in making that move you're just gonna blow it and the reason that, that those thermals are coming down is that crick's cold and it's cooling that air around that crick. And so that air is falling down that canyon. So that's why you get the different wind in the crick bottoms. And that's pretty consistent, right? If it's like a cool north face, it's just always kind of going down. Especially if it's timbered and there's not a lot of sunshine getting in the... Top three things that you all do to improve and develop mental toughness? Uh, I do... Crick baths, <laughs> cold showers, <laughs> and um, That's anything tough. that creates a movement that causes your body impact that you have to make a decision to do. 
Was that quick baths? Crick baths. Oh, crick baths. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> crick baths. It's like, I haven't yeah. tried in that. Out. The old like you, guys are going, you guys are going to the showers. I'm in the creek. So. Yeah. 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 The old Wim Hof, Iceman. It's good stuff. Oh. Buy more llamas. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, sometimes when I'm hunting, um, I'll leave my cod at home. I mean, get, make myself good. <laughs> uh, I don't find that to be true. <laughs> sometimes. Um, you know, so I'm 56 years old, you know, so I'm getting up there and I know my son's 12 and you saw him. He's, I've got my hands full in the next few years, right? So I have to be very um, focused on this. And so I want to put him and me in challenging spots. We did a rifle hunt last year, snow up to our booties, 60 mile an hour winds. I mean, just brutal cold. Hiked in seven, eight miles, got in. It was pretty much us and the outfitters. <laughs> it was, was, was it ended up being, and it was really tough, you know, and he did great. And uh, so you just got to put yourself in tough spots. Don't be afraid. Like so many guys, and this is one thing I'll say about Lampers. I mean, you know, he's patient, patient. But, dude, if there's 30 minutes left on that bear a day, we're going. We might not make it, but we're going to try. And other guys be like, oh, man, that's a yeah. – oh, you know, that's yeah. going to be a hard get over there. And Night every, hike. every opportunity is missed, yep. right? You, you, don't be afraid to take the chances, guys. It's, it's not going to kill you to sleep in the mountains overnight. Unless you get ate by a grizzly bear. Well, I mean, yeah, unless, bears will kill you. They're gonna, if they're going to eat you there, they're going to eat you at camp. I mean, they're actually, you're probably more or less like, like Brian said, he's really, I hope you guys picked up on that, not camping on the trails in grizzly country. Um, we packed out of a bear hunt just recently because we had blood on us. We had just killed a bear. We couldn't get off the trail, and there was grizzly stomp tracks all down this trail. And I'm like, we are in a dangerous spot. And there was nowhere to go. It was just that trail was it. So anyway, just challenge yourself, guys. I mean, don't be, you know, go after things that might seem a little hard to get to. Or um, I just see so many guys waiting for these opportunities, and they end up missing the opportunity because they. Yeah. they're diff- You heard Brian speaking, guys. You heard Lamp. Pick up on what he's saying. They see it. They do it. They don't question it. They don't think about it. Now, there's a time for patience, and there's time for waiting out. When it's go time, it's go time. Yeah. Um, and so. I- I've learned to just do that more in my life. Yeah, I think adding a couple of real hard things in the off season, like whether that's long hikes, heavy weighted hikes. I mean, we used to do that. I don't do it as much now as I used to. Um, now I just hike with weight and try to make that very uncomfortable. But, you know, we used to do these death marches and those were hard, like hundred mile treks. You got a start point and you got an end point and you have to get there and you got to do it. And you hike with good buddies that, can help you out if there's a situation, but, um, knowing that you can get over 30 plus miles a day, uh, for consecutive days in the end, you kind of feed back on those situations or look back on those and say, well, I did that, you know, this isn't that that difficult. So I think just adding a few hard things to your, um, to your summer, you know, fitness that you do Spartan races. We used to do Spartan races, um, train to hunt events, just things that, like he'll mention a little bit, shared suffering with others. Um, doing hard things, I think, is is probably the best way to build that mental toughness. Have yeah. a couple babies. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, guys. I, I think uh, actually every time I do something hard and I think I can't do it, I literally say, "You had two babies. Suck it up. This is nothing, <laughs> yeah. right? Like this is going to be over in like a couple hours. Like yeah. there's find- hard things that happen in your life, and you get through it, and it's great at the end, right? But that's what I think. Yeah, I tell my daughter that a lot. You know, when we do when we do these long hikes that are a little bit uncomfortable for her, you know, as soon as we get to the spot that we're going to, um, that pain's gone. Like you, you almost forget about it immediately. Um, so we like to make them do hard things, cover long distances, and then, you know, usually it doesn't kill you. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't kill you. Anything that creates some adversity where you have to make a tough decision to stay out there or whatever, it's going to create some mental toughness. I I think that, um, though, there's no shortcut to it. You don't get to just say, well, I'm going to go do this impossible thing and do it. Like, it's incremental. You have to develop it in stages. Discipline begets discipline. So I always say set yourself up to succeed, not to fail. So 
start out with, okay, I'm going to go on a solo two day trip up this far and in this place, something that you know is achievable, but will be a little bit tough. You do that first before you go to the 14 day, you know, super that you're going to fail and you're going to come home. A lot of people will. So incrementally build up that capability. Discipline begets discipline. Start with something that you know you can succeed at. And then the next time, stretch that a little bit more and do that thing and and succeed at that one and succeed at that one. And the more you set yourself up to succeed and you build on that, the mental toughness comes with it in, in the right form. There's no, you don't just, it doesn't just work that you're like, all right, go do the death hike. These guys who do the death hike, most of them will quit if they haven't done all that other work leading to the death death hike. That's all I'm saying is do the little stuff first up to that big thing, but set your goal for that big thing. Yeah, yeah it's pretty easy and, to find difficult things. I mean, you, in Brian's uh, Barney's speech, you heard him say, you know, it was 10 below and he's still going running. Yeah. Or if it's it's raining, you know, monsoon outside, he's still going running. Hot temps, still probably working out that day. So it's those yeah. Little things like that that aren't that difficult to set up, but in the end, you just you just get tougher. Yeah, my one of my biggest keys is on a hunt. My my goal that I've set for myself and the requirement and my expectation is to harvest an animal. Like as much as I love seeing the scenery, looking at the elk, listening to them bugle, I require myself to go up there and be successful. And so that's that drives me the entire hunt. Um, I'm always thinking of if it takes that next ridge to be successful, because I'm not in the same physical shape these guys are, but I can use some of that mental toughness and that requirement that if that is the plan that I can, out of all the plans I can come up with, that's going to lead me to success. I don't care where it's at. And so it's always driving me. If I fail a stock, guess what? I've still expected myself to be successful on the next stock on that next night, that next morning, the next call is going to be the one. And so we're always driving a number two really quick. And one thing we, I've got hunting buddies that are tougher than, you know, woodpecker lips. They are, they are tough, hard guys. And we've, when we leave the trailhead, there's an unspoken pact between us. You ever get down, my job as a hunting partner is to lift your ass right back up. If, if you get down, I'm not letting you quit. You cannot come with, up with an excuse good enough to leave this mountain while I'm on it. We've committed to this place. And so early on before, and that's one thing like over the years and experience, like you just, mental toughness is earned on the mountain. You just get more and more. But before that time, I will, I would be lying if I said we, me and my hunting buddies did not rely on each other. You know, you made a bad shot, you missed, um, your, your legs hurt, you got a blister, whatever it might be. We can sit there, lift each other up, um, and, and keep each other on the mountain when it's, it's easy to, you know, go try a new spot or try a softer spot, get out of the elk, whatever it may be. And so for, for us, you know, having, having diehard, uh, hunting partners with similar ideas and expectations is is it was key early on. Yeah, you know Brian said something. You know, back in my younger days, I used to do some Ironman racing, and it just killed me how many guys would be like, you know, the bike is 112 miles, and they would do like 80 mile rides to train, right? And then somehow they thought that after they swam two and a half, they'd just be able to rip off that 112 miles and then be able to run the marathon, right? And then their long runs would be 12, 14 miles. And I'm like, that ain't going to work out. So if you're going to go five miles in, your hikes before you go need to be more than five miles. You know, I, I get so many with this course that I'm teaching. So many do. I teach a whole module on hunt parameters and hunt parameters for me, basically is setting your zone that you can handle. And once you get outside that zone, your hunt becomes miserable. If you're outside your limits or your expectations, you're autumn, you're on a downslope at that point. You are less effective. There's elk a mile from the road. You just got to work maybe a little different strategy maybe if they're remote. There's lots of ways to do it. So just because you can hike 10 miles, five, it doesn't matter what you can do. You set yourself up to do what you can do and what you're trained, what you're physically trained to do. And so, you know, the mar- I'll say the last thing about this training thing because there's a lo- – how Higdon, and there's all these marathon plans. And the long runs end up at 18 miles. Well, last time I looked, the marathon's 26 miles. So I would do these epic rides. I would do 240-mile rides. I would do 30-mile runs. And not like breaking land speed records, guys, okay? But when you think about 112, once you've done 240, you're like, I, this ain't no problem. My confidence going in, I know I can hike to miles. No problem. I'm comfortable. I'm confident. 
But I'm like, oh, man, I haven't ever done a 10-mile backcountry before. I <laughs> hope I can get there. <sighs> it's not good. It probably won't end up good. So Brian was very – I hope you guys are listening to that incremental thing because don't try to do things that are out – and keep your hunting buddies in, in mind too. You're think, only as strong as your weakest link. I think um, how you talk to yourself – in the mountains, but in, in all aspects of your life is really important. It's huge. You know, when I'm on the mountain and it's really hard or I'm in pain, I mean, I just tell myself, it's just work. It's just work. It's just pain. And then I just do it. And that's from years of suffering and doing work. And I'm like, it's just what it is. It's work. It's pain. And, and it doesn't bother me now. And I also don't tell myself I can't do it what if you won't make it that I don't have that. I'm just like, you're going to do it. You're, 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 you're going to, you're going to make it happen. You're just going to do it. I don't give myself any negative feedback. You know, yeah. I just, I would also say though, as a physician and having had Dr. Corey talk about what he talked and then going through Taylor this weekend is like, you also know with the people that you're with, you do need to know their limitations. And if you are in a position where their limitation is much less than yours and they're in a situation like, I just use you Taylor as an example. I don't mean to single you out, but like if you're in a situation and your buddy did that hike with it and he got up there for you and now he can't walk and now he may be having a blood clot or, you know, you, you've also got to be aware enough to realize that again, your weakest link may end up taking you off the mountain and you have to be okay with that because sometimes stuff just happens. Like nobody meant for it to happen, but everyone has sometimes that thing that will happen and you may feel bad like Taylor was just a mess she felt so bad because she felt like she ruined Matt's experience or something and we were like that's not important like you did it we're gonna get you down it's gonna be okay but you have to also be really aware of that and not get so selfish because a lot of you guys are really selfish how many of you guys are selfish (laughs) okay good like you're super selfish and you think like this is my hunt you're screwing up my hunt. So again, pick your partners well. Make sure they're trained. Don't just like, or like, don't take your wife up to the top of the mountain and she hasn't trained with you and expect her to backcountry hunt, right? It's the same thing with your hunt partners. You need to like make sure that they're at the level at which you can do. And if God forbid something happens, you're okay with walking out of there and leaving your hunt because that's obviously more important. So that's what I see. Yeah, I like, these guys. I like to pick your partners thing because yeah, um, these guys are tough, Ryan, but they do it together to a lot. lot. <laughs> <laughs> he, he tries, tries to, to kill you. Dead on the first, my first night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, and I talk like this because um, remember, I've known Ryan longer than anybody in this room, and I've been on some pretty serious things with Ryan, where I am literally like, if you do not stop right now, I like we'll never talk to you again and then he'll be like oh this is hard for you and i'm like "Ah!" and he'll stop it's just like i have to tell him that's another thing also communication taylor went and hid behind a tree she sat down she couldn't get back up but she also didn't want to make a big scene right people do that they go choke in the bathroom on their food because they don't want to disrupt people's meals at a restaurant right and so it's the same thing like I you have to say your limitations like I have to stop honey I cannot walk anymore I'm like gonna fall over or whatever and he'll stop and he gets it so also I've known Ryan a long time you should have just said he doesn't have to stop yeah you just have to say Ryan I have all you have to do is tell Ryan I have to stop and it's gonna work because you know what he'll do is he will say okay let's stop here and set up camp and so, I'm going to walk another, <laughs> like Barney, I'll do suck it too. It up, yeah, suck it up. No, that wasn't the situation. But situation. like, he can hike another five miles. Just let me set up camp here and stay here and recover a little bit. I don't need maybe to get to camp right now and go as far as you can, right? So he needs to listen to me. But Hillary, he can the way that you walk. handle this is, is you never admit that you – are tired you're like dude there's got to be an elk i'm sure there's one in this basin <laughs> we should stop right here in glass are you just Probably saying the, hey, man, the llamas need a break you yeah, know yeah. the llamas need a break and we're pushing them too hard well no, the everybody's story was, different too ryan can literally walk like he could walk for days non-stop yeah. So yeah. we packed non-stop. in and we carried rafts in right we've told this story a couple times i don't know if all of you heard it but we crossed a bunch of these rivers in early spring right which 
Y'all know what can happen, right? The snow's up there. We're watching the weather. Don't worry, Mark. If, if it gets hot and the rivers get uncrossable, we've got our rafts. But we got llamas, and we'll um, we'll get some food to you somehow. We'll we, you know we'll we'll get we'll raft back in, and we'll airdrop some food in here to you if you if you get stuck back here. Don't worry about it. Yeah, and that gave you an <laughs> eerie feeling. <laughs> well, I was more attentive to the water levels than they were. Um, I was like, oh, Brian's getting a little warm. <laughs> so anyway, we got out of there. But all right, yeah. well, it looks like. Bye, Phelps. Bye, guys. I'll send you your stuff. See you, Jason. Okay. See you, bud. See you, Cody. Good luck, everybody, this fall. Is there any more questions? It's not really a question. I'd just like to give Mark the opportunity to announce to the world his disc shooting champion. Oh, Ooh. geez. You were the champion. Yeah, I missed don't the disc shooting last nonsense. night. He's not he was the disc shooting champion. <laughs> he he was claiming hits that weren't hits. <laughs> <laughs> We've got video. I mean, two and we're going to be reviewing two it too. People have pulled the video. Kyan's going to pull it up, and we're going to review. It was all actually pretty much a miracle that that happened. Actually, <laughs> those who are talking to some of our some of the guys from out east that are coming out here. We don't have mountains to climb. I have to walk all the way across the state of Oklahoma and back and not gain 2,000 feet of elevation. <laughs> so, is there anything in your own personal life, fitness regimen that you're doing that you find has this affable or has more carryover into the backcountry yeah. for those of us that can't just go skip, up, skip through the mountains for the day or those types of things? About the only thing that I do, um, I mean, we don't have the biggest gym in our basement, but we did build one of those, what they call plow boxes. Mm-hmm. It's wooden boxes. And we just do step ups. You know, challenge yourself for an hour long session of step ups as frequently as possible. Whether you got kettlebells in your hands or just put a backpack on, weighted vest, whatever. Um, I feel like that action, that movement translates very well to hiking steep mountains. And we'll just put heavy packs on like he will, just as much weight and just walk. Because that's what he loves to do. He's just going to walk. He's never going to be like, uh, you know, that's what he does. So I see him. He just, I try to pick that backpack up out of the garage when I'm cleaning it. And I'm like, what? He's carrying this on his back. But he'll just walk like that and go for hikes and stuff with that. Brian, you run a lot, don't you? Yeah. Uh, trail running seems to help out. But I do like elevation as well. I think it's good to 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 teach those muscles endurance. So the step ups I think is great. And even just body exercises, squats, lunges, anything with your legs. And then, yeah, I would get out and cover some miles, whether it's with the pack on and, um, doing hiking or whether it's, um, uh, running out there to teach those muscles endurance as well. And just make sure that you don't forget your bow, right? So we'll do a workout where we'll just put three arrows out and we'll, do a like suicide run. You run a hundred yards, 200 yards. You come back to that arrow. You shoot that arrow. You run back, you run to that next arrow. Maybe you do 30 air squats. Then you shoot that arrow. Then you run back and you do it again. And you know, whether you're doing step ups or running or whatever, you're use that opportunity and use that, that physical exertion to be able to bring your mind where it needs to be when you're breathing so hard and all those things and make sure that you can still control that shot no matter what. And then you can really incorporate the physical fitness and the mental fitness all in one thing for the ultimate goal of being, you know, physically fit and mentally fit to shoot that shot. Guys spend time, functional fitness. I mean, they're kind of alluding to this, but do try to replicate what you're going to do when you're hunting. I hunt with a dude, He's still doing triathlons this day. I'm retired. Trains like a fiend. And he comes out there, and the first two days, he's killing me. Like I'm like, dude, you got to slow down. You're killing me. But after two, day two or three, I'm killing him. He's not used to the pack weight. His back's hurting him. His boots are – he's having calf issues. He's having – you know, and he's fit. He just is not functionally fit. So I see this with CrossFitters. They get body, you know, weightlifters. Um, they become so muscle dense. Then they got all kinds of dehydration problems and they got energy store, pro- and being able to store enough energy for the muscle mass they're carrying. So functional fitness box, you know, just think through if you don't have a hill, create a hill. The boxes, the, the stair, the staircase, when you go to the stadium. When you, when you go to the and- gym, do things that do stair masters, do, the, the one the 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 machine that's guaranteed to Satan's never have ladder. anybody on it is the 
what's the Satan what's flatter. the versa climber? Nobody's <laughs> ever on that thing. So start using that, baby. But seriously, that I I've got a lot of friends that are really fit, but when they get the pack on, they start falling apart. And I think for us older guys, um, you know, Ryan, we're <laughs> Well, well, you're old. We're all getting a little you're up in the age. You're almost the 50s. I think um, diet and nutrition, so we clear that inflammation, is really important. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to keep the chemicals and the garbage and the unhealthy stuff out of our bodies and then replen- put all the good stuff in it, keep our bodies so that they can clear inflammation pretty quick, not a lot of swelling. And I think it's real important for me anyway. I, I do like to lift some heavy weight. I like to do some squats and deadlifts. Not super heavy, but moderate stuff and be a consistent on that. Lunges, some just sort of fitness type stuff with weight. Then if you really though want to be fit for the mountains, you got to add the actual activity you're going to do to your fitness regimen. Like what Joel was saying, you know, Ryan, you're going to climb something. So put on something heavy and climb. That's what you're going to be doing. And and add the shooting in there as well and add that functional activity into it. So I think it's a combination of a lot of factors. But for me, you know, doing uh, box squats, one-legged squats, heavy front squats, back squats, all those things are – they kind of really help my knees – stay strong and healthy in my ankles and I keep up some mobility. My back is stronger. I like to do that, but it's just a couple of days a week. And, but the most of my fitness is running a couple miles, um, every other day or every day, three, four miles. And then I like to do the little weightlifting a couple of days a week. I'll do a hundred burpees a couple of days a week on some workouts. And then, and then it's hike with a pack up a steep hill. And if you don't have a hill, Stairs. What do you guys do for mobility? I'm for me. You should see Ryan. He's super flexible. What He's was the question? Kinds... What do you do for mobility? mobility. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. For me, you don't, you don't want to hear. <laughs> Can't tell. You don't want to hear my that's, answer. That's why I'm in the condition I'm in right in this moment. I, I do a bunch of stretching. Yeah, it's a big key to my back. I used to have back issues. Uh, I like to do everything everybody said from trail running to lifting weights to keeping my strength up there. And then I do a lot for mobility and flexibility is huge for me. When I would pull my back out, it wasn't like I was lifting something too heavy. It was like I was lifting and twisting and I didn't have the flexibility. So I started doing stretching. So I do stretching most nights while I'm hanging out with the wife and kids, I'll stretch on the floor and stretch. And it takes a long time to gain flexibility. It's really tough enough. Us as guys, we get so stiff, like we just lose our flexibility. So stretching is huge for me. I do zero stretching, by the way. I, need I, to do more. I used to be anti-stretching. I know it's great. It's probably something I should be doing, but, uh, We've had this running well, joke. Well, I was a yoga teacher forever. For years, so I was like, just come to a yoga class, do some. And he's just like, yeah, no. Because I'm still pretty flexible, but I just, he, I don't know. I just don't ever stretch. I never yeah, have. his theory was like, don't stretch, it injures you. That's what he I don't, would say to me. Not I heard that. a track coach once, like he had a really good spiel on, um, now it wasn't all stretching, but specific certain stretches, common stretches that a lot of people do, um, open up joints to the point where, it creates injuries and uh, a lot of the stretches you know, is pulling your leg back and stuff like that actually opens up those joints in it and it's uh, more harmful than good so i, I was in really... high school and i have probably not stretched a day since high school <laughs> <laughs> I, that's the only excuse he needed one teacher to tell him one I know, I'm like, that is some bad advice that doctor put in his brain forever but or that teacher pretty much without injury so it's worked for me. It doesn't work for everybody. I, I think uh, I like uh, The Supple Leopard. I've talked about it on my podcast a number of times by Kelly Starrett. It's a book. It has lots of diagrams and pictures. Um, it's mostly like rolling around with a lacrosse ball, using some rubber bands to to move the joints a little bit while you you do stretch. But I don't really do static stretches, you know, bend over, touch my toes. Almost all the stretching I do is under load. So a squat is a stretch. You know, when you throw a bar on your back and you squat down, I'll see people do their first squat and 
it's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. Their knees come forward and they do something and their toes, their heels come up and they're on their toes. That's not a squat, you know, being able to, to go down with the right form and feel comfortable. If you could sit here and take a dump for 30 minutes, which some, that's a skill, you know, and I've got it. So this stuff right here and then under load, you come back up and you work on that kind of stuff. That is a stretch, stretching your adductors, your hamstrings, your calves, your, your Achilles, all that stuff. But under weight, you actually will elongate that muscle much faster than you would if you just did it without load. And the load, I have really tight muscle tissue. Like there are some people, probably you, especially women, it's like they're made out of rubber. Like they just, they hyperextend into positions. I'm, I have really dense muscle. And when I, when I try to get into position, it's like Mark, it doesn't want to go throw a 300 pound bar on your back and I can stretch a lot further than I can without the bar. I need the bar to get me to, to get mobility and to get the strength. So proper mechanics under load. That's how I like to stretch. Supple leopard. Um, I just, I'm going to head out. So I just want to say thanks. So guys, nice meeting everybody. Appreciate it. It great weekend. Thank right you. On, thanks Mitch. All right. Well, any more? That was quite a Q&A. Thanks, guys. That's good. You guys good? Mm-hmm. Yeah.